Welcome everybody to Evening Sessions. Our Evening Sessions is a monthly adult program series featuring fun and engaging mix of presentations, lectures, workshops, demonstrations, author visits, and performances on topics covering the arts, culture, history, science, and more. Um, for those who may not have heard, the library did recently move to um, curbside service. So if uh, this is news to you, just so you know, uh, all of our branches have our regular hours. However, we're not currently open for browsing. Instead, if you give us a call, uh, we will bring the books out to you. We will find what you're looking for, um, whether it's books, movies, um, some of our STEM kits for kids, all those things can still get checked out like normal. We'll bring them right to you. Um, we also have uh, all of our online services are still going. We have our Hoopla and Overdrive to get your books, movies, um, ebooks, uh, e audio books downloaded onto your device so you can access the library 24 7. And we're also offering different digital programs like this one. Uh, check out our calendar to see what's coming up. Today we have uh, Jordan from Electric Kitch here in Bay City um, ready to talk to us about the importance of archiving. Jordan. Hi, everybody. Uh, I can't thank you enough and the, the library and everybody for tuning in. It's the first time I've done anything uh, like this, really. And it kind of feels like a school presentation uh, in adult form, uh, but very, you know, PG. So this is great. Uh, so, yeah, I wanted to. Um, talk about first the word library uh, and, and how maybe I got into some of this, uh, but it stems from, from the word Lieber and it means to be free and in all, all sense of the word. And um, this is where we even get liberty from too. Uh, but this is very important um, in naming a library after being free because they wanted that sort of knowledge and wisdom to be passed on in, in an archival form and always free like and the only way to uh be be free as like in a free person a free mind um uh this goes back to even that that know thyself so these libraries were uh were set up um for that very very purpose um and it goes along with, with one of my favorite sayings. It's an ancient saying that says, the lips of wisdom are closed except to the ears of understanding. And these are the same people that are telling you that knowledge is free and, and books are free. And that's why libraries are still free today and we can use them as we, as we do. And um, uh, before we get into some heavy stuff, I wanna, since, since uh, yeah, I'm Jordan Price, uh, co-owner of Electric Kitch here. Um, and I, well, since we're talking about libraries and records and music, we're, we're a record store and sort of, sort of like a, a, a minimal archivist of, of certain eras of like pop culture and other things. Um, but there's, there's a lot of things I can relate here to music, books, and archiving. Um, and there's a great book on this. It was called The Music Library. It was written uh, and archived by Johnny Trunk, who also runs a label. Um, but this book is about library records. And what library records are were, were catalogs that either numerous music studios, production studios had for commercials, uh, movies that may have been uh, they may have been filming or shooting and these these records were not for sale they were just for the studios to use as in their archive um, and I had one queued up here <laughs> I don't know if we could hear it but this is a sound effects record from from major records um, and yeah they, they show planes and <laughs> bombs and firecrackers and uh, so back for these studio archives, uh, people had to go out and record trains and record gunshots. And it was a very laborious task. Uh, um, it took a lot of time. It was all real time. 
Um, and, and, and there are a lot of famous field recording artists. And, and this is very important, say the 1950s when no one say in the Western hemisphere heard a, you know, bird recordings over in the Eastern hemisphere, or, I mean, this, this could go for any sort of numerous things, music as well. So for, for people to start doing this, this sort of, uh, this way of archiving for, for libraries, music production studios, and maybe they didn't even know it at the time, but they were creating something that, you know, would turn into to something like this because the, you know, and, and media music, something like this, where you're just constantly producing music in an archive uh, that isn't even meant to technically be discovered. I mean, people weren't digging this up until they weren't even using these things anymore. Um, and finally, someone said, well, what happened to all this music? What happened to these people who were archiving this? And it's a, it's a, it's a cool book to start on. Uh, really diving into some of that stuff. And I'm fortunate to have uh, some of the, the library records that, I, that I've shown you. And there are, I, there are thousands, thousands of these out there. <laughs> and there's probably some that we don't even know about since they may have only printed, you know, five or six or seven and then stashed away somewhere. We hear about stuff getting thrown away um, or lost in a fire. And that's where I want to go next. Uh, everyone knows, not everyone, but the, the, maybe the biggest uh, loss of a physical archive in the known world is the Library of Alexandria, where most of the physical archives were, were lost. Um, but even before Alexandria in Uruk, what is, what is southern Iraq now, um, and <laughs> This was, this was at the time in the 1930s, 1920s, 1930s, when a lot of this was being excavated, uh, was, was in Uruk was when they found uh, the first evidence at the time of a personal collection, a personal archive. People were starting to, to collect like writings and certain documents like on paper and it was being passed along. It wasn't something that was, just being like discarded as ephemera, what we're what we call maybe ephemera, um, uh, and this is very important, I think, because it it can now we have traces of history to where maybe we didn't before. But the more that we uncover and the more that we keep digging, it seems the more we keep going further back in time. Uh, but burnings of these uh, places seem to keep happening. Um, and you know, like I said in Alexandria, there are there are many questions of still what happened. I have <laughs> my book, and I uh, this is the Library of Alexandria here, uh, the Center of Learning in the Ancient World. And you know, and and, and even Roy McLeod says we we got to keep going back because we just we just don't know. Um, and I want to you know bring that to. Uh, Egypt and what we we know as Egypt um, and its former name was Kemet and what it's called now is Hekupta and because of you know and the only reason I know this is because I'm digging in libraries and archives and I and I'm and I'm talking to people who are doing the same thing otherwise I probably wouldn't I wouldn't know these names of the ancient world or even what it's called in, uh, uh, you know, their their country. But I also wanted to relate this to, to me as something that hits home that that I didn't know for a very long time. Um, were the names of tribes of indigenous peoples here, and I belong to the Oneida Nation, which is part of the Iroquois Nation. Um, but for a long time, especially as a child, I never realized that those names were not the names that the tribe called themselves. They were the names of the colonizers that, so Nida is a, a French name, Iroquois is a French name. Aren't, and you'll have to forgive me, but Oneida is really Onidyota Akko. And it's hard to pronounce that because the dialect has been 
and the language has been basically like taken out of the culture um, and, re and replaced with, with more like a Anglo names, I should say. Um, and, and, and this is where I started my journey kind of into word archeology span or etymology. I began to be fascinated with the beginning of words um, because I, I, I started to see that, that language and law and history all go together. And um, if you can understand where the words came from or why they use them, you, I mean, you can understand anything about the law, anything about any time frame, really. Um, and, it, and it won't matter if you don't know the names of who was in power, but just what was happening and things like that. It, it becomes a really different tale of what's going on. Um, I bring up, so this leads me to the word alchemy. Um, and I'm not sure, people use this word all, all the time for, uh, you know, and, and it does have a, a lot of like uses, misuses, like cooking and cooking up alchemy. But first of all, the, the word literally means to come from Kemet. So we're talking old Egypt now, but if you look up alchemy, um, you're talking about turning metal in or, or odd metal, like junk metal into gold and stuff. And that uh, it's really not what it means at all. Um, so to come from Kemet, come from Egypt, same with chemistry. Chemistry is Kemet, chemistry. Um, this is all to come from Egypt. And I, I do believe they're trying to tell us in the language that this stuff is older than we know, but since it's not brought up in language, you're really not reading a dictionary to understand where these words are coming from. We're really not, we're really not getting it. So in this, I bring up laser discs now and I bring up alchemy and laser discs. So, uh, and if you don't know what a laser disc is, I don't have one handy, but it is a uh, 12 inch disc that store, digitally stores analog uh, footage on, on it and, and plays it back digitally with a laser. Um, it's like a, it's a giant CD, same as a record. But there are certain things on laser discs that were never produced otherwise. And I have a strange laser disc that was put out by the Smithsonian. Maybe it was put out on VHS. But they talk about alchemy as being um, a very 15th, 16th century Anglo, like French and British, um, like that part of the world kind of thing. Um, and that's it. That, I mean, that's what the Smithsonian was saying about this. Uh, that's what they put out as like, and this is what we have, but, and this is what these people believed. And when you go back, when you look at that word, like I said, well, when does even Kemet and Egypt come into play? And we're talking 3,000 years ago. So the time frame that they're telling us is a heck of a lot different, and they're, what they're talking about is a heck of a lot different. So I think we always have to do our research and even research what I'm saying. You know, there's, there's, there's so much information um, and misinformation that we find on a personal archive journey um, that, you know, it's not necessarily like a guided education uh, like school, but at the same time, it isn't as free as one either. Uh, and the main thing is that it's okay to be wrong sometimes um, and look at many sides and, uh, you know, just, just to figure, figure it out. Um, but the etymology kind of blew my mind because um, uh, language was taught to understand law. So if you, you don't understand the language of the law that's ruling you, you really, you really have no clue what's going on. And our, I mean, our laws are pretty lenient here, but even as normal people and citizens, we really don't know too much about the law. And I mean, that's obviously maybe why we have lawyers and things like that, but you can find out everything uh, not everything, but you can find out a lot of interesting things about the lang about law if you study language. Um, and I, I do recommend books. There's a book uh, 
called the uh, the esoteric structure of the alphabet and it's it's heavy uh <laughs> it was unlike anything i had kind of ever heard before or but but it was a thing that i was l looking for um and sometimes that's that's the other thing is you kind of have to open yourself up to things that maybe would be uncomfortable or you don't even understand uh because you'd never heard of it before um and you, yeah you just can't let that kind of thing hold you back uh really so let's get into uh i want to talk about some of the modern burnings that have happened um this might not seem so modern but in in the late 1500s uh the florentine codex which was like the end all be all for the aztec culture was completely destroyed by diego de landa who is a franciscan monk um and <laughs> when i looked into this uh a while back the franciscan monks were known for burning archives around the world of of the indigenous cultures and there there are books on this and i mean they're not i haven't re read all of them obviously uh but um just doing wor work on uh archives that have been burned it's 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 the saddest story it, it's so hard and that, and i think that's that's why it's been so hard to uncover some of this history is that these things have been constantly burned and not and and gone and destroyed um on purpose too um so that that was that was a that was kind of a big one here in the americas but more recently in 2008 Uni sony universal had a studio in california an archive studio and and basically a preservation hall of, they, they said it was about 125, 125,000 to 175,000 master recordings. And Sony Universal, for, for you can research this, for lack of better anything, they own about half of the world's music that we hear. And all that is gone. All, that happened in 2008. You're talking about 100, about 150,000 physical pieces of archives that are now gone. Now people have their own physical archives of them. And that is one important aspect of why I, I do think record keeping and bookkeeping and physicality of stuff is so important. Um, because now we know what has happened. We can all say that we, we have a copy of the original artifact. And while that is devastating, um, and while it's not known to a lot of people, um, we still have the physicality of it. And this, this, this brings me to iTunes because a lot of people who did like physical archives um, ditched their physical and analog stuff during the digital revolution and starting with Napster downloads and, and then going into iTunes. And, and people were excited about it. Um, you know, you didn't have to move anything anymore. Uh, it was backbreaking, and and you could have a hundred thousand songs on a tiny little disk drive. And then the thing about that too is the physical piece of media that that person had. If he didn't steal it directly from a store or from an artist, he, he bought it. He, that person had to have purchased that thing. Um, where I know a lot of people don't purchase, <laughs> and I, I can't say for everybody, uh, but don't purchase the material that they're downloading online or just simply listening to, because there are countless ways to listen to music for free online. And uh, the radio, we don't have to go into the radio either, uh, besides the radio and artists not getting paid for it. So that's the one thing. Now we seem to be destroying the physicality of, of the artist's representation of what that artist, that person can get paid for. Um, we're just taking it out of thin air. And to do that physically, you would have to rip that from the person's hands like take that record take that book you know and and 
people just take the digital medium really for granted as, as this great, it frees up everything, but here's what it does. So people got rid of their physical, if people got rid of their physical archives, if I got rid of all this physical stuff and we just trusted nothing, we're, 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 we're trusting a, a source that is like held together by nothing. It can be wiped away by a magnet. Um, then we have it, then, we, then we're back at Alexandria and we're back with nothing because no one had an archive of it. No one had records of it. And, and it's not just the libraries, but it's, it's the people. And I mean, this, is, this is why I, I, I believe it's so important to keep these things alive. Um, and in 2019, another disaster for the physical media world happened is uh, a plant called the Apollo Masters plant, which makes the lacquer, the first step in plating vinyl records burn completely to the ground, gone. Every machine they had, every, every I mean, everything. Everyone was okay, thank goodness. But the, the machines and, and everything there were gone and that, that was it. They owned every, every piece of machinery except for uh, a company in Japan that, um, supplies about 15% of the world's lacquer. But this plant, Apollo, supplied 85% of the world's lacquer. To, and like I said, this is the first step in making a vinyl. So if you wanna make a vinyl, you gotta get lacquer. But now the plant's gone and there is no rebuilding this. It, the, their materials were grandfathered in. So we can't rebuild in California. and and so on and so forth. So right now, the, the industry is looking at ways to, to revive this. And there are, there are people who are looking at ways that around this because this has been about an 80 year standard um, and it's time for some innovation. Nothing has changed on this. And I think that, that maybe this is part of a, a new revival of, of archiving here, as, as you might say. But that, that was quite devastating. Um, and to have no physical things, to make physical things, um, you know, it's all one really big circle. I mean, we need things mined and people need to deliver this. And, and, and I mean, you can see where the cycle goes and, and artists need to keep creating and we need to keep, keep doing this to keep things going to, to you know, connect these dots from the past so that we can have a, a better future and a better understanding of, of our past too. Um, so I, I think I, if it's, if we have time, I just want to show some of my, um, talk about some of the, the personal archives here. Uh, so back in, oh God, was it 2009, uh, 2010, Black Circle Radio was started by Mitch Anderson, uh, and I was a co-host there at CMU. Um, yeah, because it's going to be 12, it's going to be 12 years this program will be on air. And it was an all vinyl radio program at CMU uh, that we did for two years there, and Mitch has now been uh, strong at it since then. But uh, this is this box here is part of our first show's archive where we recorded everything um, that we did, all the talk sets. Um, and we are doing it the hard way because we didn't really have a great, great system set up. And now Mitch, as he does his shows, just records and archives. And, you, you know, I mean, a, a lot of podcasts and people do this, but just to have this weird physical copy before um, internet archiving was such a thing is to have this physical thing is, is I don't know, it's monumental. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's our st starting point, you know, our, our stone there. <laughs> so um, uh, I also wanna bring up uh, a man named Mike Johnston, who is a teacher out at Delta, uh, music writer, historian, musician, uh, recording engineer, photographer. Um, 
you've done some pretty heavy and cool things as some of our guests have <laughs> i know too uh but th this is this is and wow and, and things like i said things always come full circle so mike johnson has a radio show huge archivist his radio shows on sunday nights uh if you want to listen to it on delta uh free he's been doing it forever um he was able to get a hold of a few records by an, a jazz artist, avant-garde jazz artist named Sun Ra. And these records were unreleased at the time in the 1990s. And these were, these, these were recordings from the early 70s that just had never been pressed. They had a master recording and a test pressing, but they never went to, they never went to press. So yeah, it seems weird that Mike would end up with these very esoteric recordings, but he did. And he, he got them and he made a copy of them because he, he thought that they would never ever be uh, you know, released. And he gave them back to the person who was with Sun Ra and he made these two CDs. We can get a decent shot of them, of his own artwork. And he made them for himself and a friend. And he gave them to a friend and about 15, 20 years ago. And a friend lost them along the way. And about two years ago, someone had found them in a store, a thrift store in Detroit, brought them back here to me and said, hey, I found these, do you want them? And knowing Mike and being friends with Mike, I knew immediately that this was Mike's artwork, but had no clue what this Sun Ra stuff was. So I called Mike and said, I picked up, I, I have some stuff that you did, some Sun Ra things. And he did, where did you get that? And I told him the story. And uh, uh, later on, these recordings had been released they're released now on vinyl you can listen to them but before that we're talking minuscule people even had known kind of about these things and um you know this is what i mean about personal archives why this isn't going to make major news um sometimes this is life-changing for people and it you know it connects the dots um a person my, my dear friend jeff walker We've connected the dots uh, on records that we thought, and, and that we never see. But it, to me, it's it, it's the connection of the of the person too, right there. Um, and I really can't say that more than enough. That and, and that's how I feel about records is that um, the physicality of it. Uh, I, I mean, a human has to be making it from beginning to the end. And it's, and it's really, I mean, it's the only physical medium like that uh, where a, a human still has to do it. So it's the most human experience to me if, if you wanna feel connected to someone's music and this is done right, like someone who knows what, cause you can mess this up big time, <laughs> but when it's done right, it's really a, 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 it's really a, a human experience like in, the, in our phenomenal like physical world. Um, and here's kind of a cool Sun Ra research book or uh, fanzine that was put out in 96. So I'm not, you know, the only Sun Ra guy uh, in town. Um, uh, what, and this is one of my favorite books um, that I came across doing uh, archi uh, archival research and etymology. And it's a really tiny book. And it's mythological astronomy of the ancients demonstrated. And I, and I found it because I, I was doing research on celestial mechanics, which is basically the movement of the, of the stars. And, they, and, and it brought me to a book on ast astrotheology and, and astronomy of, of the old. So it's, I never would have known about this book. I, I believe it's in print by... Um, Scholarly Select, which is, I want to, I want to say it's owned or run by the Library of Congress, where some of these books that are so rare that they own or like Oxford Press, like they will just make copies of it and then send you a bound book if you want like a physical copy and it's like 30 bucks. 
which I don't know a lot of people know that they'll do that for you. Um, and it's really cool. I have a, a plenty of those, but I do think this is one of them that is in the, the scholarly selects where, you know, they have a copy and they'll print it for you. Um, let me see. And then uh, I also just wanted to talk about one of my favorite musicians uh, and poets. Um, and, and it was his one, this is one of his records, Griot Galaxy, his bands. His name is Farouk Zibay. Uh, he was he's from Detroit, grew up in Detroit, uh, lived here. Um, he passed away in 2012. Um, he also wrote a book called Towards a Rational Aesthetic. Um, it's a rare book and, a, and they're rare records. Uh, and interesting is to say the least, I think the first four pages of the book, I just read over and over and over again. Um, <laughs> because he's, he's talking about things you've heard of, but he was correlating them in ways I, I, I had never heard before. So, and I was lucky enough to not only meet this man, but talk to him. And uh, I bring up Mike Johnston and Mike Johnston said about Farouk that no one has ever said so much without saying nothing. And that was so true because I, Farouk was just a very tall, stoic man that uh, really, you know, spoke through his music and, and words. And just looking at him, you could, you could tell. And I feel very fortunate, <laughs> pretty much to, to have that experience and all the experience that I've had coming across. Um, being what's known as a record collector, but like I said, I think it's more of a, an archive because we're archiving pieces of history that connect us, not, not just to the past, present, future, but to other people. Like we're meeting our, our, our best, like our new family members this way. We have met our new family members this way. Uh, it's, it's wild. And there's, there's other, there's people watching um, can't call them out, but they have monster record collections and book collections, um, and they know the importance of history and why why it's why it's good to do this, and why it's good to have our libraries and why you can just go there minus COVID now, but why you could in normal days uh, just go there and start picking out of books and. I'll end, I'll end this too with why Google just doesn't do this for you. And you can Google anything, but there's no starting point. At a library, you can start anywhere you want. If you wanna go look at books on history, you can just start and find a title that will be interesting to you or landscaping or architecture. And if, do it. Google this and type in like architecture books and see what comes up and see how boring it is and see what they try and sell you for the first 30 pages. That's all that comes up. It tells you nothing. You'll learn nothing. And that's anything. That's all Google is, is like how to buy stuff. Sorry. <laughs> and <laughs> but that's what the library was for. And that's how like I found all this stuff, you know, and that's why they archive stuff like Silent Spring, which is another mid-Michigan book, you know, Rachel Carson. Like I tried to pick all this Michigan stuff here um, to show that how connected this all really is. Um, and, you know, honestly, really, I mean, I, I feel like I just traded for most of this stuff. Like some of it's expensive and some of it you will realize that um, if you do want to have something that's well worth in the archive, it might have a, a wild monetary value, but that's kind of the price of like knowing that you got it and knowing that you can like always go to it where like, oh no, my computer froze. And I do realize that this is susceptible to water and fire, but it's made it like a pretty long time a pretty long time like this book is old you know so and this computer it's still gonna outlast this computer too and so that's why we keep our library so thank you and i i 
I guess I can take some questions now. <laughs> Thanks everybody for listening. Uh, whether you are on Zoom or if you are on Facebook, if you put the any questions you have for Jordan into the chat, we will read them. <laughs> One comment on the Facebook Live was from Steph and she said she didn't know that's where your kitty's name came from. <laughs> oh, okay. Thanks, Steph. Yeah. And then someone else um, commented, there really is something so incredible about having that physical thing. Um, so this was very interesting and thank you for putting it together, Jordan. Wow, thank you. Uh, we have a question on uh, Zoom. Uh, how can individual archivist collectors work they say work together. Yeah, how could we, how can archivists work together? Uh, that I'm sorry, I'm just thinking about this question because um, to me, it's all about uh, like archiving what's important. And when you, yeah, when you find the right person. Um, that you could work with, uh, things just sort of like pop in. And it's it's not just like physical things too. It, it's like, it, it, I don't know, it's something in the metaphysical, whatever you wanna call it, but um, um, so how can we work together? Are you just talking maybe just in these times or? Uh, I, well, I would say in, in pre-COVID times, and I think one of our other uh, listeners, Bruce had this concept too, where you'd invite people over and open up your archive basically. And just like a library, um, that, that, that was my main idea is that a lot, of, a lot of these collectors, record collectors or audiophile people um, have their stuff just closed up. For the as for them, like and, and I I just want to share stuff, and I think that's the the biggest thing is like if you know you can open your doors up and kind of allow this dialogue to uh, you know let people into your archive and vice versa, and people that want want to um, get into this, um, I really think that might be the best way is to kind of share it. And doing so right now, I guess I don't exactly know how. Uh, this was a, this is a very interesting way. Like I said, I haven't done. This is my second Zoom meeting, so uh, there could be obviously people are probably doing this, you know, showing what they have. I, but um, yeah, I'm sure there could be ways to do this via Zoom and the internet. Um, someone on Facebook is asking, as far as vinyl records go, do you view your collection or archive more as a collection of sounds or a historical timeline? They're both, they really go hand in hand, especially from the time period for me that I'm, I've mainly, I mean, I still buy new things as well, brand, brand new records, but the really interesting thing about that uh, uh, is if you're going from the fifth, let's just say 50s, 60s, and 70s, you're talking about the equipment that was used in every aspect from, from making the vinyl um, to recording it to the instruments produced, everything was changing. Every from, And I'm not even talking like year to year, I'm talking day to day. There is a great website that uh, one of the um, engineers from Columbia Broadcasting, he said, it, I can't remember the website, I have it archived somewhere, but he talks about how every day their engineers were bringing down a different microphone or a different reel-to-reel. -reel. Every, every day they had something different for them to try out back in like from 1958 
you're talking on up all the way to the digital era there was just new things like constantly everyone was trying to innovate on like old tape on tape tape machines um different recording equipment microphones instruments i mean the, so when you get into the at aspect you're talking like how different not only the music sounded but like every single record because like the the technology was changing the things that they were doing were changing um and it's really wild it's really it's really cool and then you start to learn about history where you like uh if you like the audio aspect of it it's like after the after world war ii most of the audio engineers were navy submarine operators because that's where all the tube based technology was at the time and they brought that into the recording studios um, and these were the people that knew how to operate it they necessarily weren't artists but they were machine operators and um, they created something with artists like i said day in day out that was that was kind of groundbreaking so when you when you start to get records um, from that era on up like i said it's it's really cool to learn about all the all that <laughs> all the all of it <laughs> uh, we have another comment from facebook that you maybe you have some thoughts to riff on uh it says y'all at EK Electric Kitch have really given me a new appreciation for physical copies of the music I love. I got lost for so long in random playlists, hearing one song from a single artist at random instead of listening to a whole album, learning to appreciate the artist for who they are. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, thanks. And I, I could talk about that too, because you're artists. Uh, and there's a few artists here watching, but selling the physical copy is like you said what helps what helps you go to the next gig or what helps you get more physical copies um and too many too many people were are digging in in the itunes you're talking like people have publishers um <laughs> they have webmasters <laughs> like these producers i mean the the list like went way up as soon as internet digital streaming hit as far as like who else like needed to get paid besides the artist, it was already kind of bad with physical stuff. But now, yeah, the record is is that's that's how they make the most money, and it's it, it's shifting towards more of an independently owned facet than anything. And I'm talking like in the mainstream, like. Um, I mean, records in the mainstream are mainly kept up by like a lower percentage of the people who kind of buy them, I think. Um, and and th there's no, I'm not saying there's a BBC article about this too, that was that was done recently, a couple of years ago. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, it, it's the best way for the artist, for to me, to, I mean, not only to listen to the person, to listen to the artist, uh, but the easiest way for that person to get paid and, and for you to like have, have that available to you all the time and it's yours. Uh, another comment from Facebook from Brendan, uh, great words of wisdom, Jordan. I owe those in the community. <laughs> I always those in the community of collectors were more likely to branch out into other activities that enrich the culture. It's a legacy of memories that are created when people celebrate art. I don't know who I'd be without tying a purpose to my addiction. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, and I don't think you have to even lie like, oh, I, I, you know, lie to yourself about buying records like I just never do or about finding a piece of uh, you know what I would call maybe historic either records or equipment. Um, I'm always looking for things I've never seen before because what is it? Like I've never seen it. You know, I guess I got that explorer kind of mentality. Like I don't even need to go in the space. Like, I mean it's it's pretty wild down here what you can find. <laughs> Uh. 
Well, I think that wraps up our questions. Thank you so much uh, for speaking with us today, Jordan. Um, and for those of you, if you want to find Jordan, he is in downtown Bay City at Electric Kitch. Um, and I think a lot of people are familiar with that, but they, you guys have a Facebook page, right? We do, that's uh, our what, main source of traffic is the Facebook page. So if anybody wants to follow up with him, I'm sure you can find him there. Um, but thank you everyone for coming. Um, oops. <laughs> and we will, uh, hopefully we'll see you around the library, um, but with curbside. Uh, and we'll see you at some other future programs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.